Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Katie from Greenlight, and we're thrilled to host tonight's event with Jay Nicole Jones, presenting her new book, Low Country. She'll be talking with Allie Robottom, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to Nicole, Allie, and the team at Catapult for making this happen, and to all of you for showing up. Though we're not able to host events in our store spaces, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. Before we get started, there's just a few housekeeping things to go over. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. They can see that you're here, though, and you can see a count of fellow attendees at the top of your Zoom screen, but the exact location will depend on what kind of device you're using. There are a couple of different ways that you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. That's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and to interact with fellow attendees. So if you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program, so please make sure you're putting your questions there and not in the chat. And importantly, tonight's featured book, Low Country, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person in our bookstore locations, 12 p.m. to 7 p.m. every day of the week, and you can purchase Nicole's book and many others on site. Or order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S. I'll drop the file link in the chat in just a moment. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Our interviewer for tonight is Allie Robottom. Her critically acclaimed debut memoir, Jello Girls, was a 2018 New York Times Editor's Choice selection, Amazon Best Book of the Month, Indie Next Pick, and Real Simple Best Book of the Year. Her essays and short fiction can be found in Vanity Fair, Salon, and elsewhere. She holds a PhD in literature and creative writing from the University of Houston and an MFA from the California Institute of the Arts and lives in Los Angeles with her husband, the writer John Lindsay. She will be speaking with our featured author, Jay Nicole Jones. She received her MFA in creative nonfiction from Columbia University and has since held editorial positions at Vice Magazine and Vanity Fair. Her viral essay defending the art of the memoir, Why Is Everyone So Down on the Memoir, was published by the Los Angeles Review of Books and Salon, and her reviews and other writings have, been, have appeared in magazines, including Harper's. She grew up in South Carolina and now lives in Brooklyn and Tennessee. Her new book, Low Country, is an incandescent uh, debut memoir of one family's changing fortunes in the low country of South Carolina, a tale inseparable from the region's storms and shipwrecks. Nicole is going to start us off with a reading from the book, and then she'll be talking with Allie and with all of you. Please take it away, Nicole. Thank you so much, uh, Katie and Allie and Greenlight and everyone who's here. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to start off reading um, just the first page or two. Um, from Low Country um, with this fabulous cover. I can't stop looking at the cover. Once down in the Low Country, I saw the ghost of a woman I knew well. Not the cool silver specters observed by men that portend danger and violent endings, but a beauty who basked in wide strands of sunshine and predicted nothing but herself. She walked slowly along the shore as if taking in the clear winter sky and soothing song of low tide surf on the beach that connects the boardwalk with Ocean Boulevard on one side and with the Atlantic on the other. It was the first day of a new year, an easy time to get lost in the portal crease between calendar pages or any pages really. Ours is a tourist town, alive only half the year at most. And who is to say that spirits do not need a vacation every now and then like the rest of us? She did not see me as she had in life and I froze breathless, unable to move for equal fear of her attention and her vanishing. I watched his figure as she strolled and smiled, a seductive curving form that might pass for the lolling dunes behind us or the sprawl of waves beyond. She looked in her white pleated shorts and pink bikini top like any other visitor in search of something from our beach to take home, wherever that might be these days. While I breathe, I hope, says our humble state motto, but surely there is hope for the ghosts of South Carolina too. 
I have seen a few such unbelievable occurrences and have heard of many more. Across inlets tinted the lavender gray of looming afternoon storm clouds and marshes fringed green and gold with reedy Spartina grass. This coast has entertained the most distinguished of pirates and every sort of sea monster from mermaids and megalodons to slave ships and surging tempests. Now the history is hidden beneath the plastic indignities of scratchy astroturf and fiberglass minotaurs that invite tourists to play miles of miniature golf courses for which the city of Myrtle Beach is distinguished as the world's capital. A selection of historical dinner theater that is awfully forgetful caters to out of towners with inelegant accents who come for tans and leave with tattoos. A coast is fundamentally a liminal space, I suppose. Our family has made its living off the stories and legends of the low country since long before my lifetime. With my brothers and cousins, all sons of sons except for me, I have searched for buried treasure, rumored to have been hidden by the pirate Blackbeard under this looking glass sand. When we did not find it there, we dug up the briny slime of pluff mud at low tide and stalked the pines at the edges of the family's golf courses, looking for relics of our history. Under bed sheet tents printed with dinosaurs and a glow in candlelight, my dad and his brother brought to life sunken galleons, crumbled plantations, and cemeteries haunted by the eternally unfulfilled souls of lonely women and lovelorn daughters carried away by sea or sickness. Vengeful spirit remains among the main opportunities for ambitious women in the low country, and I took notes as the boys took cover. I know several God-fearing folks who claim to have seen with their own eyes the gray man pacing the beaches of Polly's Island before hurricanes Hugo and Hazel. Some will say they've seen him before the lesser unnamed storms of recent years, though any kid here can tell you that is not how it works. If the laws are few and far between in South Carolina, the rules that govern our folklore are kept strict and any ghost worth her salt respects such soundness. So you see, even as the law has little place here, a crooked logic carries sway. Like many native sons and daughters, the gray man rouses for a hurricane, and it is a stroke of luck to be forewarned of approaching danger by whoever he was. Hold your breath when going past a graveyard, unless you want to breathe in a lost and lingering soul. Hang your empty bottles from tree branches to catch a stray evil eye. Paint your ceilings the calm, cool blue of a late September sky after an almighty storm to trick the haints from coming out at night. It really is a lovely color. What is tradition if not a truce with the unknown of which there isn't as much as there used to be? Good ghost stories have disappeared as fast as decency in these times. Like a full moon ocean wave or a tree branch in a hurricane, an authentic one will knock you over the side of the head. A sideways glance is the most graceful escape in the direct path of such forces, though it is a discipline to look away. Okay. That was beautiful, Nicole. Congratulations again. Um, I love this book so much. This memoir is just beautiful. Um, I think to start, I wondered if you might talk a little bit just about the origins of Low Country for you, um, where the material came from, when the project began, even if it had many beginnings, like what prompted you to write it um, at every stage along the way? Yeah, um, I think it's definitely a book that's had many, many beginnings. Um, I mean, I grew up hearing a lot of these stories, a lot of the folklore kind of mixed in with um, the family stories that you know everyone accumulates and um, retells over and over. So I think I, as I started to become a reader, um, I just started writing down um, little notes of you know things that I would hear that I thought was interesting. That I really liked, you know, the wording of how 
my grandmother or an uncle put it or um so i i think that it really just started from little scribbles and really just reading a lot and um really snowballed from there <laughs> um, so. i know that feeling yeah you say in the book at one point that um kind of towards the end and i don't think i'm giving anything away by saying this but that um a journal with a lot of your Nana's stories in it were stolen. Um, did you then just sort of like recreate them from memory? Because I've I've also had that experience and I found it devastating. And and so I'm just wondering how you picked up the pieces after that. Oh, Ali, I'm so sorry that happened to you. Yeah, it's terrible. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I um, I had a, a draft of of what I thought would be this book. Um, that I had kind of been writing, you know, through the years, and I um, did my MFA, and my thesis was, you know, a, a very, very different form of this, and um, so I, I got to a, a place where I thought that it was, um, you know, okay enough to send out, and it was stolen, and I had a really hard time writing after that, you know, I thought, um, maybe I'll, I'll go to law school now, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, um, it was really, really difficult and um, back up, back up your work. Um, but I think about six or seven months after that happened, I, um, I lost my grandmother kind of suddenly. And it was a lot of, um, from memory, just uh, sitting down and needing to hear her voice. I've got some voice recordings and, you know, voicemails and um, what started as kind of going through that and just needing to needing to hear her um, after she had you know passed away um, turned into me combing through you know Gmail and looking at really really old drafts and um, yeah kind of really cobbling what I could together. Well I'm so glad you didn't decide to go to law school and that you did cobble things together because it it's just such a beautiful product. Um, speaking of Nana, I, I so admire how she emerges as sort of the heroine of the book in many ways, um, about halfway through, as opposed to say, right at the outset, um, which like, of course, when I reread the book, I saw her very like slyly seated at the beginning, which I hadn't noticed on my first read. Um, but I think you do a really lovely job of sort of allowing her to emerge and surprise the reader. Um, where did the, like, where did her storyline fall in your early understanding of the book? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I think when I started to rewrite this after, you know, after I had lost, um, you know, what I thought was, um, what it would be would be um, I really started reconsidering her her role and her placement and really like the goal in retelling these stories um, and I think that a lot of this book was really thinking about when we learn things as kids and how to unlearn them and so you know you see um, you know you, you see uh, my my grandfather being you know not not great to her and you know you start to wonder how much of that is internalized and what do I need to do to really get that out and how can I restructure this story so that uh, certain things come to life and how can I reclaim uh, stories and and time by uh, by telling these stories and you know through structure and um, other fun things. Yeah, I, I so like, well, I just really admired how um, subtle everything felt on this book um, and very artful. Like, I think a lot of the times with such ambitious memoir in particular, it can be kind of hard to like, like I've definitely had this experience before, like keep all of the divergent threads organized and still maintain like this extremely um, lush and dreamy quality that you've landed so well. Um, I like, I was so taken in particular by Justin Taylor's blurb for it. He called it a fever dream. 
Um, and that's how it reads to me. Like it's both completely immersive and um, also really sort of like sprawling in this in this really admirable way. Um, I'd love for that reason to hear you talk a little bit about your relationship to structure. Um, like when in the writing of the book did it emerge for you? Do you have in your mind this like scaffolding that you can see that you've somehow made invisible to us? Because um, I can't find it. And I tend to like read looking to see if I can see how the writer's done it. And when I read this book, I'm like, how did she do this? It's, it's phenomenal. Um, gosh, you're so nice. Everyone's so nice. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I, you know, the, the structure was something I really thought long and hard about. And, you know, I got a lot of, um, you know, at the beginning of writing this and starting to send it out, like, well, maybe consider making it chronological. And I really didn't want to do that. Um, and, you know, it just meant that I had more work to do, that something wasn't working. Um, that way, but I I wanted to kind of recreate the the feeling of being in a family conversation and of remembering and trying to remember and of sorting through all the different versions of stories and, and history that you you get. Um, you know, I think memory is fundamentally unreliable, um, and it was really important to me to be upfront with that and. Um, interrogate that um, and and also for for it to feel like you're participating in like the oral storytelling process um, and yeah I mean also I really just like elliptical um, structure <laughs> in some books so um, I think my my goal was to uh, you know make the book, the structure of the book, um, sort of shaped like a like a hurricane. If that doesn't sound, um, you know, ridiculous, the last page I wanted to connect back to the first, and so much of remembering is, it does feel like time travel. It's like going counterclockwise, and um, yeah, I mean, so much of the landscape in South Carolina on the coast there is really defined by um, by the weather, and you know hurricanes can, you know, really re redo a coastline. And um, I wanted the process of, of reading to feel like that, you know, you're going through and you can uh, redo things and um, go backwards, but also go forwards. Uh, um, I love that. I mean, that's like the perfect way to describe the structure of, of this book, I think. Um, and it really does sort of like read that way. Like it's it's cyclical, but it also builds in sort of this like dramatic way that um, keeps you turning pages in a way that like, I too love elliptical books, and but it, I don't always feel like compelled to keep turning the page, but I definitely did in Low Country. And I thought that that was like a really good balance of those two sort of formal choices to make the book elliptical and, and whatnot, but also to keep it tense and keep it like clipping along, which I really admire. Um, you say in the book, here, I wrote this down. Um, I used to think I learned storytelling from my dad, but then later on you say, like next page over, you say, I know now that I was already filled with the stories of women and then later still you write, the stories of women like their bodies and lives are fuller, rounder, softer, prone to repetition, like love, like songs, like ghosts. Um, and so sort of related to the structure question, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about your relationship as a writer, both to storytelling, but maybe specifically to the storytelling of women. Yeah, that's such an interesting um, question. Um, yeah, I, I wanted a lot of repetition in, in the book to, you know, kind of uh, reflect uh, songs and story storytelling orally, you know. Um, and I think in, in our family, I, I imagine it's probably this way in a lot of families, you know, um, there's, a, there's a lot of men in my family and they're, 
uh, very big storytellers, you know, they very easily fill a room and are very, you know, charismatic. And um, I'm, I'm not that kind of storyteller. I think mm -hmm. I'm certainly kind of a, you know, sit in the corner and watch and listen. Um, but so, you know, I grew up seeing that and it seems, you know, more interesting and fun at first. And then you know, they leave the room and specifically with my grandmother, she would be like, let me tell you, that's not what happened. This is what actually <laughs> happened, <laughs> you know? Um, so I think that that comes from a very literal place of, you know, being like, this is, you know, I'm the, you know, the, the recorder and this is actually what happened. Um, but also um, kind of beginning to realize that, you know, my, my dad is a, a writer, he's a songwriter and, uh, we grew up with like lots of like, you know, legal pads and uh, rhyming dictionaries and a thesaurus on every table. So it was very obvious to think, oh, I got, that's, that's from that. Um, but growing up, you do start to realize that uh, the choices that you make and the, the truths that you know do come from the stories that you've heard from, uh, from the women in my life. Um, so, I think it was a, a deeper kind of storytelling. Mm. I think it, like that idea of women telling stories or saying really anything at all in this sort of like circular fashion um, feels really performed by the like formally in the book um, in this really satisfying way. Like there's a way in which like about every page or two, it feels like you've taken like a big turn and maybe you started the story over here on like this page. And then like later you finish it, maybe three pages later, but like in the meantime, you've taken us on this wild journey and, and full of digressions um, that somehow like I never get lost during. Um, is there a way in which like the women in your family or maybe women in general, if you want to make a very bold generalization are sort of prone to that kind of circularity. Um, and, and like, I am i don't know, I'm putting it to you. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I think that, uh, I mean, stories when they're performed, I think are for the audience, you know? Um, but I think with my family, you know, with my grandmother who I write about, the stories were for uh, connection and truth and herself too. I think they were a link to, uh, to herself and a realm um, where she had some authority in her life um, that she didn't probably in other areas. Uh, so. I, I wonder if that's true for a lot of women. Um, you know, the what's the purpose behind you know the storytelling? Is it you know because you're in a bar and um, back when that was the thing, and you know you, you know you're having a good time, or or is it you know let me pass this this truth on to you? Um, and I, I if I were to generalize, I would say that you know uh, maybe women do that a little more. Yeah, I think I remember reading somewhere that like, you know, in corporate settings, they oftentimes like bring in sort of counselors to teach the men in the room that like, though, like the women at the boardroom table or whatever might be like taking longer to get to their point, their point is actually worth waiting around for because like women do tend to talk in these sort of like larger arcs, but yeah. on the way we like, <laughs> throw away a bunch of like really useful information so it's like best to listen up and not like cut us off you know which like yeah. so often happens yeah women are better listeners too I mean I think of, um, objectively that's like a, a thing right um yeah, <laughs> yeah um to the men of the audience but um I, that's like a yeah there are statistics for you know how long a woman will listen and, um versus a guy so um I mean that's certainly like I don't know, maybe the most important part of storytelling uh, is listening, I think. Yeah. Did your Nana, was she sort of the like, so in the book, for anyone who hasn't read it yet, 
um, we are treated to this sort of like wonderful interlacing of ghost story in with um, the other primary narrative threads. And I sort of wondered about a, the choice to include those ghost stories and whether that was always part of the book. Like, was that an, sort of like an original concept or did that come in later? And then also like where your earliest memories of those stories come from and maybe what like your earliest ghost story experience was. Um, well, that's fun. Um, I mean, really um, Beth, about my earliest ghost story um, memory is, is from the, the section that I just read, you know, hearing, um, you know, my my dad and uh, his brother, my uncle Leslie, talk about uh, the gray man, you know, and um, another ghost who features in the book is um, Alice Flagg is very popular um, in uh, South Carolina. Her story is really well known. Um, so those are for sure among my earliest, earliest memories. Um, but yeah, it's, they are stories that you grow up with and, you know, you don't have to be really literary to, to, to know all of them. Um, and I, I think that as I was rewriting the book, they really came to be more important. Um, I really felt like I could see in the structure kind of repetition from these ghost stories and then in the patterns that women in my life would get stuck in and it was like well what comes which comes first and and why and how can we break that down and um, make better endings um, so but yeah I mean my my Nana certainly would tell those stories and she had you know a shelf of books of you know ghost stories of the low country too that we would read and um, so it's it's everywhere um, in the region. You're just not um, unaware of it. Mm -hmm. I love too how there's so much like nuance to how the different ghosts and their stories are treated in the book. Um, you do such a lovely job of making them tender a lot of the time, or like especially your grandfather's ghost Harvey, who um, haunted his house, is like just this sort of lovely, charming character. Um, I found that really successful and quite divergent from how I related to ghost stories as a child and probably even now, which is just bad, like scary universally. But was that your experience as a child or did it just sort of feel as um, tender as I, I read it in the book? That's so nice. Um, yeah, it was... Um and accepted that uh, my, my um, mother's father lived with this ghost and it was very matter of fact, you know, it was like, you'd be eating dinner and hear a noise and I was just like, oh, that's Harvey, it's fine. Um, and you know, you start to think, well, are, are the adults kidding around? You know, are they just playing, you know, a joke on the kids or, uh, and then you start to think that it's it's a different kind of ghost story because it's very serious. You know, it's like, yeah, that's that's just him. Um, so, and I think that was um, a real difference in some of the ghost stories that you hear um, down at the beach that are kind of used to scare, you know, people. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a real contrast. You know, you grow up and you hear these stories of, um, you know, scary ghosts or, you know, somebody saw this ghost on the beach and it means that, you know, a huge disaster is about to happen. Um, and, you know, with my, uh, my mother's father, it was very, very chill and it was a real different way to consider um, not just ghosts, but the, the things that you live with and uh, what is worth interrogating, you know, and not from a fearful place. Did the um, sort of historical thread in the book feel similarly to you worth interrogating, not from a fearful place? I like, I asked because um, I find that writing about a place like can be actually really scary if you're from that place and, and you have mixed feelings or sort of like torn between returning and not returning. Um, I'm just curious about your relationship to that element of the book. 
Yeah, um, that was really important um, theme for me to get across that feeling so torn um, about a place that is very beautiful, um, but that also has a really dark and complicated history. And um, I really wanted the landscape to be uh, a character and the history to be a character. Um, and so when I was writing, I, was, I hoped that, uh, you know, the history that we learned in school was clear, but then, you know, there's the, the narrator voice coming back in and saying, well, we should have also learned all this other stuff. Yeah, I mean, and that's such a, like, those sort of asides and digressions are so, um, characteristic of your narrative voice in this book in this like again really what looks to me effortless way um but feels also like extremely tied to a southern tradition of sort of storytelling on the page that reads almost like uh, an orally told story um sentences that sort of spool out and then get reeled back in um those feel also to me like extremely tied to that Southern tradition and yet like very your own. Um, and I would just love to hear you talk, you know, to take us in this direction a little bit about your relationship to sentence making. Oh, and also I just wanna tell um, our audience that if they wanna leave questions in the Q and A section, now's a good time to start doing that. Thanks, Ali. Uh, yeah. Um... I think it's probably a little different for maybe everyone and and every writer. Um, but when I I started this book, probably every time I started this book, it really started with my um, my grandmother's voice, who is she has a very very thick southern accent and has the the rhythm that you're talking about built into it. Um, the really really long. Um, circling back and oh well you remember this from this other story or this other time or they were coming from this place instead and then you know punctuated by these shorter um, sentences so I think just in the speech um, that I grew up around that's really built into um, the way that you uh, told stories and heard stories so writing those down it, it kind of made sense um, to kind of do that in the, the prose as well. And it was really easy to fall into, not easy, but, um, you know, it felt really natural trying to um, link the two, the dialogue and the, uh, the prose bridges. Mm -hmm. Did you find that, like, this is sort of like a business of writing question, but like early on in your writing life, um, if you were sort of tending toward that, um, that approach to your sentence making and, and to syntax in general, like that you would encounter teachers, um, mentors, whatever, that were trying to like dissuade you from it. Um, I find that like oftentimes with students or, or um, mentees and whatnot, like people will come in, come to me and like have this really unique form and say like, oh, you know, I was told that that was something that like I should try to like air away from. I'm just curious about your your early life as a writer. No, well, yeah, I'm very curious how you advise your <laughs> your students. Um, uh, I can't I can't think of anyone telling me not to do that. I think I've been told other things <laughs> not to do. Um, uh, but I think that. I heard a lot when I first started um, kind of writing longer things or attempting to write creative nonfiction that the, my writing on the page was very Southern, which surprised me um, because I don't really um, think of myself as, uh, well, I don't really have much of an accent. Um, and so that was a real surprise um, that I think uh, as you're just kind of learning to be um, a person with your own voice, you kind of learn your own writing voice, which will, I think, vary from project to project too. Yeah, I tell my students that like, um, the thing that everyone tells you to change 
about your writing is usually, um, you know, not always, but usually something to nurture and preserve about your writing. Like that's what's special. Um, and like, certainly I've struggled with that in my writing as well. Like just being told that, you know, certain things are even, and, and I find this particularly true with like more like feminine forms, um, like more maybe digressive or dreamy writing states that like they need to be chronologically ordered or, um, you know, somehow made shorter and, and more consumable. So um, I'm glad you didn't run into to too much of that. <laughs> Shouldn't sound like they're in good <laughs> Um, well, we still have a little more time. I guess my last question for you about Low Country um, has to do with um, what books inspired the writing of this book and what books sort of inspired your early reading and writing life aside from the ghost stories that we know um, you were you were consuming and, and your Nana stories. What were the books that sort of shaped you as a writer? Yeah. Um, and shaped this book as a book also. I would love to know this. I mean, I talk about books all day. Um, <laughs> I mean, I loved, I mean, the best part of grad school for me, um, I know I think people have complicated opinions about MFAs, but um, was um, all of the, the reading and the book recommendations and, you know, the people who could steer you toward things you would not have picked up otherwise or, you know, um, are not out in big piles like Barnes and Noble. So, um, yeah, I, uh, um, The Woman Warrior is, um, I, I mean, I reread that constantly just because I love um, the story and her voice. And um, yeah, I mean, I think Maxine on Kingston is um, a genius. Um, so that's one that I read for, for pleasure all the time. Um, so that's a huge one um, in terms of memoirs. Um, I really love, there's this memoir called Hours by uh, Sergei Devlatov um, that I just adore. I really love his writing. He's very funny and very wry, um, but also, you know, really writing about um, like major tragedies and it's just seamless and flawless. And um, yeah, I could spend all day um, with his writing. Um, those were, were big, big ones that I reread a lot. Um, yeah, running in the family that Michael and Dashe memoir is beautiful and really interesting because he, he kind of um, shuffles different forms and there's poetry and there's pictures and little snippets from newspapers and um, that's a great one. Um, so yeah, I just could go on and on and on. I just read, yeah, Aftershocks, that Nadia Osuk book is just stunning and beautiful. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, books that really shaped, um, uh, my reading as a kid. Um, I write about this briefly. Um, I loved, um, their eyes were watching God. We got assigned, mm -hmm. um, when I was in the ninth grade, you know, and 14 is still a kid, but I had never read anything that was so about, uh, the lives of women and was just so gorgeous and, it is one of those books that I, you know, latched onto that as a as a teenager, um, but then you reread it as an adult and appreciate so so much more. Um, so, yeah. I think in the book you say that it felt like comforting to you to read. Their eyes were watching God because it reminded you of the way that you heard stories from the women in your life. Is that right? Am I remembering yeah, that? Yeah, I a good memory. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember having a similar experience with that book around the same age. Like, I think that it's probably quite common if we both felt that way about it. Like, um, but I think that there's something too about like books like yours, books like Low Country and, and a tradition of books that really like stand out against the sort of more like masculine forms that a lot of us um, are sort of given to read in school uh, more regularly. And so like, it feels like you've done a really great job fitting this, your book into this tradition of, of 
books that stand outside those more conventional narrative forms that can sort of offer um, young people uh, another option and maybe an option that feels closer to home for them. Oh, that's so nice. I hope so. I mean, I love, um, yeah, uh, weird books or books with <laughs> Uh, unconventional structures are just like the best. So I, yeah, that's like, I hope so. <laughs> um, I'm sure of it. Um, well, I was going to open it up for Q&A and I see we have a couple of questions. So um, if it's okay with you, Nicole, I'm going to yeah. field some of them. I'll allow them some of, some of them your way. Um, okay. Well, this is a good one. Um, while reading Low Country, or while writing Low Country, who did you imagine is your ideal reader? Um, that is a really interesting question. Um, I think one of those cliches that you hear a lot as, as a writer, uh, you know, write the book that you'd want to read um, was very, very true for me. Um, so, yeah, I write the book that you would want to read, I think. Um, it was hard for me to really imagine anyone reading it because it was so, so personal and so filled with the voices of uh, people I loved, um, especially at first. So um, yeah, I think I just imagined writing it for, um, for myself or for my grandmother. How does it feel now that you're sharing it with the world? It's it's very, yeah, it's something that I've worked on for a really long time. And um, yeah, just to have it out in the world and to have it um, it's so beautiful, the cover and um, just, yeah, to be supported by so many wonderful people is, yeah, it's a, Great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, how about another craft question um, from Meka? I'd love to hear, is someone reading this? Oh, yes. I'd love to hear about a craft question that may be on your mind for your current projects. I think she meant it for both of us, but I'm more interested in you. <laughs> I was just thinking, I want to hear what I'm doing. Or we can... <laughs> Um, you go first and then I will think of it. Um, I've been doing a lot of reading uh, or trying to find books that uh, are about um, narrators who are sort of falling apart. Um, and um, yeah, so, you know, how you keep the ties of certain um, narrative threads going, but also seeding um, what's going to happen later or, um, yeah, I've been, I've been trying to figure that out. Um, I guess I was trying to figure it out for this book too, but um, perpetually wondering how um, other brilliant people do it. Um, what about you, Ali? Um yeah, I wonder that too. I think in sort of a broad way, um, I made the transition, at least for now, from writing more memoir and nonfiction to trying fiction. And um, this isn't really like a singular craft question, but it's been a real challenge for me to um, differentiate plot from sort of the emotional core of the book and figure out, whereas like in memoir, I feel like I've always let the emotional core of the book drive the narrative. And, and of course it's like predetermined by life itself, but in fiction, I've been sort of grappling with how to um, marry the two together. Cause I do like a book that like reads fast and has a lot of plot to it, but then of course also it needs that wow. emotionality. That's such a good distinction. Um, yeah, I think I um, think about that a lot too. Uh, for, I mean, for memoir, I so, for this, I certainly felt like uh, 
tied to like I was serving the story you know what I mean like the story was there and I was just in service of of it um but with fiction there's that like you're in control now like you know I get to be the what's the, the Nabokov quote uh, the puppet master or whatever yeah. it's certainly the opposite I think um for writing a uh, memoir do you find that um I'm not going to ask you what you're working on now because I personally hate that question but like do you find that both in writing Low Country and in writing any other sort of memoir pieces that you've worked on like there's something really enjoyable about having that sort of predetermined order of events for yourself or do you I personally <laughs> after writing my memoir I think I found that I sort of like almost and this probably had to do with my relationship with my mother, but like in some ways, like resented the book um, or resented like her story for for subsuming mine at times. And so, like, I think I might have started writing fiction for that reason. And I'm just I'm curious, like I've always both enjoyed having a predetermined plot for lack of a better word in memoir, but then also found it like at times kind of annoying that I had to stick to what was given to me? Yeah. Um, I mean, there were certainly parts that, parts of the book or parts of, you know, what happened to, you know, our, our family um, that were difficult to revisit um, that I did not look forward to writing at times, but that I, you know, you know that they have to be in there. Um, so, um, I certainly felt that way, um, but I, I don't know, I, I found it, I don't know, that I experienced that exactly, like um, that resentment, but it was, I think, especially um, important for me too when I did write the bulk of this, you know, I was really looking to recapture um, someone that I missed spending time with. Yeah, I think that comes through and it. it it feels like such a, it has this sort of keening quality, but really more than that, it just feels like such a loving, I don't want to say a tribute, but it, like a loving conversation. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. What surprised you most by the time you finished the book that you weren't able to anticipate about the process or about how the process or how the, like, the book would turn out when you started it? Um, that's interesting. I mean, it was, it was hard to write at times, but it was also kind of fun. You know, it was, um, it felt freeing in, in a way to kind of write about um uh things that had happened or you know were difficult to experience and I think that revisiting um those with a sense of control and with the intention of re reclaiming or you know being in control of the narrative um was really freeing in a way that I didn't expect oh, that's a great answer um, I see two questions that are somewhat related. Um, so I'm going to group them together a bit. One is asking um, what the most surprising part of the publication process has been for you. And then the other um, is asking how your um, experience as an editor has informed your process as a writer and maybe also your process um, moving towards publication with Low Country? Um, yeah, it's, I think that any experience at all in the writing world is probably gonna benefit your own writing. Um, you know, just reading a lot, being around people who have advice or opinions, even if you disagree, um, is really, um, beneficial. Uh, I do a lot of copy editing and I think that um, being very particular with um, wording or language and 
the use of that is, um, yeah, has been good for my own writing, even if it's like, I'm going to do something that I know is incorrect. <laughs> I just like, you know, knowing, knowing what the right way to do something is, and then is sometimes important and thinking I'm not going to do that. Um, so yeah, I think that's been, um, I didn't set out doing that, um, thinking it would make me a better writer, but I think that it um, hopefully has, I think so. And then how about the publication process? How has that been surprising or not? <laughs> it's been a really long, a long journey. Um, and I think that if, you know, I had went back and told my myself when I was in grad school, it's gonna take you 10 years to get this out, I would have been like, oh my God. Um, but I'm very, very, very glad that it took that long. Um, I think especially with memoir, like time and perspective are your friends. Um, even if it feels frustrating sometimes. Um, so, yeah. That's a tough lesson. I, I relate to that. Um, this is a bit of an insider question, but um, can you point to a specific element of low country that is informed by or has its beginnings at Columbia where you did your MFA? Um, <laughs> um, well, I think, I, like I said before, the reading, learning to be a, a good reader and um, having lots of really wonderful uh, writers and books recommended that I would not have come across probably was um, like the most important part of school for sure. Um, I think that a ton of books that I read as a student, they're informed the book, certainly. Um, I can remember reading, running in the family uh, in a memoir writing class and I had read it, I worked at a travel bookstore for a couple of years, um, uh, which was an education as well and just wonderful um, to work at bookstores maybe. Um, so yeah, I think that those books that you encounter, that I encountered at Columbia have really stayed with me. Um, the Hunger of Memory, that Richard Rodriguez memoir really stayed with me. Um, yeah. Um, okay, well, I think we have time for one last question and I think it's a good one to go out on, um, which is sort of a, um, extension of the question about like what surprised you most about writing this book which is um did you sort of discover in the process anything about um your life or your family life um that you didn't prior like know prior to to reading the book um yeah i mean a lot of little stuff i i you know um had to oh i had to do a lot of um, research and uh, history research about the region. And, you know, I knew some of it, but some of it you don't know, like, um, and then family research, I had to ask a lot of um, questions that you don't even think to ask, like, when did, um, when did you meet this person? Or what do you remember, even if it's not factual, you know, finding out someone's impressions about something or an event is um, so important for a, a book like this. Um, yeah, my, my uncle and aunt in particular were um, like huge resources, um, you know, and finding out about um, family things that happened, um, like things that my great grandmother did that I had no idea about that sound very cool um, or wild or maybe not cool, I don't know. Um, I had never heard any of those stories before. Um, I see one more that I want to just ping, which is um, asking if you have any advice for young writers about um, remembering or retaining their childhood memories or like their family history and um, family lore. 
Um, oh, I love that one. Um, yeah, I especially after I lost um, my new books and some some pictures too. I mean, all kinds of you know weird little scribbles and things. Um, I uh, found uh, some voice recordings on you know old iPhones that I had of um, my grandparents talking and my stories that my grandmother would tell and those are now personally very very valuable to me um, you know hearing uh, the voices of um, people who have died um, who I miss that's maybe a big one I would say if if you can get permission to to talk to to people um, and record them. You'll really love having their voices um, just personally, but also, you know, that those became really important touchstones for um, writing and material and getting certain things right or getting the tone and rhythm of someone's voice right. Uh, yeah, I, I've had a similar experience. Um, does seem like the kind of thing that especially for younger writers or, or writers just starting out, it might not be like at the top of the mind of something to do, like interview your family, but it becomes so valuable later. I did a like a middle school project um, where it was like, go oh, interview your, your grandfather or whatever. Um, so I, I don't know if kids still do things like that, um, but it's maybe a really fun way to, you know, get your, um, get your stories down. Yeah, well, let's hope they do. Um, thank you so much. I think we're like right at 830. Um, and I see a message, but I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do with it. Anyways, thank you so much, Nicole. Um, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> thanks so much for that fantastic discussion. And thanks to all of you for joining us. And don't forget to buy your copy of Low Country in store or online at greenlightbookstore.com. The link is in the chat. Um, thanks so much, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you so Bye. much.